using every last breath Escaping the long way down Okay, so, I think it's obvious now. I love analog horror. And in the realm of the internet, I have come across many great horror stories told through analog means, and to my joy, many of these series are still being produced to this day with new episodes continuing to disturb, shock, and terrify. But I have recently come across an analog horror series that has managed to not only terrify me, but surpass every expectation I had of just how good analog horror can actually be. The series I'm referring to is Greylock, created by Rob Gavigan, who is known for making many horror series right here on YouTube. But Greylock is special. Hey everyone, for those who don't know, I've released an analog horror series called Greylock and just dropped a new video a couple days ago. We've been putting a ton of effort into it. I'd really appreciate if you check it out and subscribe. The series, which is still ongoing, at the moment consists of 12 episodes in which the series takes us to a horrifying reality set in Massachusetts through various time periods to tell a brilliant story of monsters, government conspiracy, and ancient evils that we can't even begin to imagine. Greylock impresses in quality, talent, and above all else, engaging storytelling that keeps you wondering what will be revealed to you next. Another thing Greylock manages to do masterfully is confuse the viewer, as the tapes in the series are very distinct from one another, making it difficult to properly put together a timeline of events of what's actually happening. But tonight, I will attempt to do just that. In this video, we are going to take a deep dive into all 12 episodes of Greylock, and at the end, I will attempt to put together a timeline of events as well as provide theories for elements without concrete answers. If you have not watched Greylock, the channel along with each individual tape is linked in my description below. Feel free to check it out for yourself and support this amazing horror series. But with all that being said, buckle your seat belts and settle in because we have our work cut out for us and we're taking a trip to the mountain. This is Greylock. Primary systems online. Reading sequence complete. The first video of the series is titled Back Online and has no text in its video description besides a link to the second tape which we will cover next. The video begins with security footage as we hear a computer voice tell us that its shutdown protocols are being successfully overridden and files are being extracted. Emergency shutdown protocols disengaged. System is offline for time code 0106. Contact technician for assistance. Welcome to Signal Dime USA Enhanced Access Operations. Please enter your clearance credentials. The user is asked to enter their credentials, which are not recognized by the computer. But this too is successfully overridden, and the user is granted administrator clearance. Clearance credential requirement overridden. Administrator privileges granted. Welcome back, I'm on user ID. What would you like to do? Search. Accessing archival storage form, GBI. As the user tries to access the computer's storage, we see an error pop up on screen when the cameras attempt to change. If we pause the video, we can make out that this camera is located in the morgue of this facility but it seems to be having issues as we are recommended to get in contact with the on-site technician. 
I also had to note down that I found it a bit odd that this facility, which seems to just contain normal office workspaces, has a morgue inside of it. But we also don't know what kind of facility this is, so we just have to roll with it for now. After the error disappears, the camera switches yet again and the computer notifies the user that a data extraction is underway. Data extraction initiated. Data extraction, 10% complete. Data extraction, 4% complete. We get the same error as before when the camera attempts to switch yet again, and the data extraction completes. But not before we get a flash of a logo for a company known as Simeodyne. And that's it. Yeah, it's a very short tape and a very short introduction to this series, but it leaves us with questions. Who is Simeodyne? Who's extracting the files? What's on the files? These questions will linger throughout the series, but the main takeaways from this video are these. There's a company known as Simeodyne. We don't know what they are all about or what their job was, but they may have had some connections to the US government. And this might have been their facility back in the day. Judging from how run down the facility looks, I think it's safe to say that they've either abandoned it or whatever work they were doing there was promptly shut down. The second is that there is someone investigating Simeodyne. They are extracting Simeodyne files for a reason that is unknown to us at this point in time, but we need to keep this info in mind as we move into our second tape, titled, To the Mountain. Dear believers, when men pursue evil, it is evil that they will find. Mark my words, there is no good that can come from the pursuit of darkness. Let me read to you, dear believer, the words of the late, brilliant Charles Spurgeon, who discussed this at length in a sermon all the way back in 1864. The second tape begins with dash cam footage taken on a snowy night. On the radio, a sermon plays that discusses the teachings of Charles Spurgeon, a real preacher from the 18th century. The radio reflects on Spurgeon's teachings about the devil and how he is man's adversary, and that if we are to pursue the devil, nothing but darkness and destruction will be thrown right back into our face. Dear believers, when men pursue evil, it is evil that they will find. Mark my words, there is no good that can come from the pursuit of darkness. Let me read to you, dear believer, the words of the late, brilliant Charles Spurgeon, who discussed this at length a sermon all the way back in 1864. He said, quote, Our adversary, the devil, goes about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. We are taught by our Lord Jesus to pray. Do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. What we are taught to seek or shun in prayer, we should equally pursue or avoid in action. Very warily, therefore, should we endeavor to avoid temptation seeking to walk in the path of obedience so that we may never be guilty of tempting the devil to tempt us. We are not to enter the thicket in search of the lion. We may pay dear. This is basically setting up the main theme of Greylock, as later on, we will see how the series is mostly about man's will to pursue knowledge, even if that knowledge brings pain and even worse things but we will get to that later. The car comes to a stop at a gate that seems to lead to a trail. The driver exits the vehicle and continues on foot through the woods. As they move through the forest, the camera footage begins to experience glitches and we are shown what appears to be bloodstains highlighted in the snow. The saturation of the camera is also noticeably higher. As the cameraman pushes forward, they come across more blood in the snow as a highly distorted voice begins to speak.
It took some time and effort, but I believe I have figured out what this voice is actually saying. I will play this segment of the video with subtitles for you now. This audio, to me, sounds like a news report that details the accounts of two men who had hiked in Mount Greylock for a long time, who came across a mangled corpse of what they first thought to be an animal, but they later found the corpse contained a human skull and, for obvious reasons, decided to contact authorities. Within this segment of the video, I also noticed some details that might help us to understand what is actually happening in this tape. As the video transitions between the saturated segments with the blood and the desaturated segments, both come across a branch lying in the snow. In the saturated video, it is covered in blood, but when we transition back to the desaturated video, the blood seems to have dried up. There's also the detail that the actual snowfall in the saturated looking video seems to be slightly heavier than that of the desaturated video footage, but that could just be me overanalyzing things. However, this leads me to believe that we are viewing two different recordings taking place at different times, but in the same location. The saturated video seems to be what the two men saw while they were hiking, and the other seems to be someone following the same trail for an unknown reason. Perhaps they are investigating Greylock, which might connect them to the file extraction that took place in the previous episode, but at this point that's just speculation. But near the end of the video, the theory of two different tape recordings seems to be confirmed when the cameramen come across the same tree in the woods. In the unsaturated video, we can see something sticking out of the tree, and I'm honestly still not sure what this could be. All it really looks like is a plank of wood wedged inside the tree, but it could be something else entirely that I'm just not getting at this point. I've seen a few theories go around about what it could be, but I'm not going to talk about them here, since we need further context from the other videos. Just keep this... thing... in mind. As the distorted audio gets excited to remind us about the human skull found among the bloody remains, the camera cuts to the dash cam as the car moves slowly and the sermon resumes. When we will come face to face with the devil himself, whether we intended to or not, dear believer, we are drawn to him by our own hearts. In Matthew chapter 15 verse 19, it says, For out of the heart come evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false witness, slander. Right off the bat, we can tell that something is off. The car is moving slowly, and whoever is driving seems to be fiddling with the lights more than they should, almost as if they're trying to figure out how they work. As the sermon continues to play, the car comes to a stop and the sermon itself begins to take a dark turn as the driver messes with the high beams, as if they're trying to see something in the distance. The pastor begins to talk about the darkness within all people. A darkness that not even themselves can recognize, and how the devil will call to that part of our humanity, and how we should accept what he bestows upon us. There is a shadow nested deep, deep within our hearts, within our minds, in a place most people 
don't even know exists within themselves. The devil is going to call to those depths, dear believer. And though you may tremble before the beast, you should make it easier on yourself and accept what it is that he bestows upon you. The driver takes off as the sermon becomes more distorted. And the video ends with the dreadful final words of, The devil has a plan for you. Like I said before, I think this video is mainly used to establish the theme of Greylock, as well as giving us a few clues to what might actually be happening. Temptation will serve as a driving theme throughout the series, but what did this video give us in terms of story? Well, we know for a fact that something weird is happening up in Mount Greylock. We know that people are turning up dead, and there is someone or a group of people investigating these events to uncover whatever might be happening up on this mountain. If you are wanting more context clues, however, don't worry. Tape 3 is the most information we're going to get at this point in this very confusing series. So, with all this being said, let's move on to the third tape. The tape begins with a warning, and right from the opening, we have the first name in the series, a person who we can follow, Alexander Michael Marsh, of whom this tape is intended for. The warning states that all other viewing of this tape is prohibited, as well as a message at the bottom of the screen saying that the video has been manufactured by Simeodyne on January 2nd, 1993. The tape goes on to give us information about a group of researchers known as Unit 13, and how they are involved with Project Stargate. Which, fun fact, was a real US government project that was started during the 1970s. It was created to study and investigate the potential for psychic phenomena in military and domestic intelligence applications. In more simple terms, it was a project created to study and find ways to apply science to psychological phenomena such as out-of-body experiences. But with the origins of the project being in the 1970s, the real reason the project was started was actually to catch up with the Russians, who the United States intelligence agencies believed to be spending millions of dollars on psychological research. The project wasn't even called Project Stargate until 1991, and was officially terminated and declassified in 1995. Which means, at the time of this tape, we are almost right in the middle of the time period in which this research was happening. The only thing disconnecting Greylock's Stargate project from the real one in our world is that Simeodyne had a partnership with the US government in the creation of the project. Greetings, and welcome to the preconditional protocols and orientation video system provided by Unit 13. As part of the United States Army and Project Stargate, created in partnership with Simeodyne USA. On behalf of all of us here at Unit 13, congratulations on your selection as one of our testing candidates. You luckily have a lot of questions, and this video is designed to answer them all. First, let's go over some background information to provide you with the crucial context you'll need for a full understanding of what it is we're doing at Unit 13. We are sure you've heard plenty of rumors surrounding what it is that we do, but we are willing to bet that most everything you've heard is wrong. Being a highly confidential part of Project Stargate, which you've already been briefed on, Unit 13 studies a revolutionary and promising area of parapsychology. Thought forms. The tape welcomes us, or rather welcomes Alexander, as a testing candidate, and explains what Unit 13 is, as well as what their goals are. It seems that Unit 13's goal is to investigate tulpas, 
more simply known as thought forms, which are explained to be manifestations of a person's inner thoughts, emotion, or will into a physical form. So, what are thought forms? Through the ages, occultists and spiritualists, Tibetan monks to theosophists, have exercised the creation of what is sometimes referred to as a tulpa, otherwise known as a thought form. A thought form is the manifestation of a person's will, emotion, or other deeply psychologically energized state into a semi-physical form, existing as not only an extension of the person, but as its own independent and sentient entity. Thought forms are also able to be witnessed and experienced by third parties, and are not limited solely to the person who developed them. Thought forms have been formed to serve as familiars, companions, or even friends to those who conjure them. According to key literature, thought forms can be intentionally formed by a single person or multiple people, though they can be unintentionally formed as well. Thought forms exist not only as an extension of the person who created them, but also as their own separate being or entity. This means that thought forms can also be witnessed by other people than the person who initially created them, and can interact with their environment. But this physicality ranges a bit, making thought forms appear most of the time like ghosts or phantoms. They can even be communicated to through Ouija boards. Traditional thought forms can vary widely in their level of influence in the real world. While they usually take physical formations eventually, their earliest stages are more apparitional in nature, with brief manifestations, though most often remaining as an unseen essence, much like a phantom or a ghost. At this phase, thought forms and ghosts are very similar in a number of ways. Individuals can make contact with them through communication devices, such as a Ouija board or through EVP sessions, while the thought form may respond through moving objects, manipulating electronics, or even speaking words in short phrases. Due to their striking similarities, a current theory established by Unit 13 suggests that what we know as ghosts may not be as common as we once believed. Rather than a deceased person's energy being left behind after death, it's possible, and indeed likely, that these paranormal entities are actually thought forms that are unintentionally created by those individuals that the deceased has left behind, who spend inordinate amounts of time in deeply emotional states, where their mental capacity is largely occupied by a powerful focus on the departed individual. In other words, as these are the ideal conditions from which thought forms are born, people may very well create their own ghosts and hauntings. These similarities have led to a theory that what many people believe to be ghosts are actually just manifested thought forms rather than an actual spirit. Thought forms can also be created unintentionally. For example, if someone has recently lost a loved one and they are going through a deep grieving process, a thought form may appear in the form of that lost loved one. So in a sense, people can create their own ghosts. We are also told that as more time has been spent in the development of the thought form, they gain more power over time, eventually becoming a fully physical entity. The goal of Unit 13 is to see if these thought forms can be used to benefit American society. Unfortunately, creating a thought form that has this much influence on their environment takes a lot of time and mental fortitude and, you know, money. With this in mind, we are told that Unit 13 has recruited the help of Dr. Bernard Hayes, a world-renowned thought form researcher. Now we have a second name to keep track of. Also, be sure to keep Dr. Bernard in your mind, as I'll let you know right now, he becomes very important later on. With the help of Dr. Bernard and his research, Unit 13 creates the thought form manifester a device used to create self-sustaining thought forms from the minds of willing participants. We are told that since thought forms come from the deepest recesses of the human mind, they can appear in any form. And sadly, the mind can come up with some pretty nasty stuff. They could look like a person, an object, an animal, or even something as abstract as the physical representation of an emotion. That being said, it's recommended to brace yourself before touring the thought form chambers, as thought forms can also take on appearances that could be considered disturbing, like a creature one might see in a childhood nightmare. There's no reason to be afraid, however. 
All thought forms are docile by nature, and while they may look or behave in a frightening manner, and though they are capable of making physical contact, they pose no threat to humans. Once your session in the thought form manifester is completed, your thought form will be securely transported directly into a containment chamber. Thought forms are unable to pass through the barrier of our We are being lied to. Every time the tape glitches, we know that the tape is holding back information from us. This information being that thought forms can, in fact, be dangerous, and that they can and probably have escaped their containment. With this video, we get some more information, uh, introducing some new elements into the series, helping us to discover what is actually going on, as well as some ties to real-world events that help ground the series into reality. We also get two names to keep track of, Alexander Michael Marsh and Dr. Bernard Hayes. It seems that this tape was made for Alexander because he was a willing participant in Unit 13's research. And we also know that Dr. Bernard Hayes is one of, if not the leading researcher of thought forms that helped Unit 13 create the Thought Form Manifester. The tape ends leaving us wondering about what will happen next and what thought forms are truly capable of. And what would happen if they escaped? Well, this leads us into tape four unexpected visitors. Just like the previous tapes, tape four is without description. We begin in the forest outside of a house, where a person records video footage of what seems to be people inside of their home, turning off the lights and getting ready for bed. The reason behind the recording of this footage, as well as the person filming, is a mystery at this point. But the video footage, coupled with the title of the video being Unexpected Visitors, I think we can all start to guess what's going to happen next. When the coast is clear, the person recording goes to the window and scopes out the area once more before entering the home. As the cameraman proceeds to climb the stairs to the next floor, the screen goes black, and we hear this. It would seem that the people living in this house have been murdered. The footage cuts forward in time, and we can see that the cameraman is walking through the forest yet again. During this walk, they stop in the middle of the forest and use their camera to take a long close-up shot of the moon. It is a strange detail to be sure, and why they do this is unknown, but we now know that the moon might have some sort of significance to the story, or at least to this person. The video then cuts to a commercial for Max Headroom, and looking into the premiere date listed in that commercial, I found that the episode it was advertising was an episode known as Dream Thieves, which aired on October 9th, 1987. Only about a month away from the famous Max Headroom hijacking incident that took place on the 22nd of November in the same year. Quick, <laughs> 
This means that the events taking place in Tape 4 must be taking place in 1987, a year that will become very eventful later on in the series. I'd like to thank my producer, producer my writers, 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 my director, director, my friends, and you, the ordinary PP people who made me what I am today. Max Headroom premieres after moonlighting tomorrow. They did love me. Eventually, the commercial is cut short by an emergency broadcast system. It seems that the break-in we witnessed earlier was one of many, with roughly 49 residents having their homes broken into around the same time by unidentified individuals. We also learn that the scope of the break-in span across towns located in Berkshire County, and the broadcast urges residents of that county to lock all their doors and windows as well as arm themselves with any weapon they can find before mentioning that no description of any of the attackers has been made, but they are armed and extremely dangerous. If you're currently away from home, we are urging you not to return home at this time. Shelter in place where you are. If you are currently not in a secure area or in a vehicle, immediately head to your closest 7 mark. Each 7 mark location is currently being used as a safe area As the broadcast continues, we cut to someone recording outside of their window, as screams can be heard outside, presumably from the other break-ins happening around the area. After a gloved hand grabs the window, many images flash on screen. Most of the images consist of some pretty nasty looking faces and gore, which I believe to represent the people who are being killed in these break-ins. But one does stand out from the rest, this strange figure that almost looks like a mask. This face will become important later on, so be sure to keep it in mind. And by the way, if it feels like I've said that a lot during this video, I apologize. This series is a great way of confusing the viewer with each video, you know, truly being a puzzle. But trust me, I'm going to do my best to answer what I can near the end of the video, so stick with me. This tape even, with all the knowledge from the other tapes before and after, is still very confusing. With the current context, it could be inferred that these home invasions could be caused by the thought forms presented to us in Tape 3, who have escaped their containment chambers, but this is not confirmed. There's also the inconsistency that, from what we know, the thought form manifester, as well as the facility used to contain the thought forms, was not created until 1993, and this tape presumably takes place in 1987. So the best thing we can do at this point is move on to the next tape and see if we get any more info later on. The next tape is a strange one, so be prepared for more confusion. The next tape is titled, Not Here, Not Now, Not Anymore. The video begins with nothing but a grey screen and two women speaking to each other. We learn that this video takes place during an ultrasound for a woman named Tiffany. We also learn that her husband couldn't make it because he couldn't get the time off of work. Well, hello again, Tiffany. Oh, 
Hi, Wanda. Nice to see you. Nice to see you, too. No dad this time. No, unfortunately, he couldn't get off work today. So I'm going to have to call him on a payphone to let him know all the details as soon as we're done. <laughs> <laughs> He's excited to be a dad, huh? The nurse, whose name is Londa, asks if the couple have picked out a name for their baby boy yet. We, we both can't wait to be parents. Aw, and you said you've been together since high school, right? Yep. That is so sweet. And have you decided on a name for your baby boy yet? Yep, we're going with Max. Ooh, Max, huh? Mm -hmm. That's a nice, strong name. <laughs> That's why my fiancé wanted it so bad. He says it'll help make him strong right off the bat. That's a pretty good way of thinking about it. So let's see how strong little Max is so you can hurry up and make that call. Yes, please. Tiffany says that they are excited to have their baby, and they've even been together since high school. All in all, everything seems normal, but we're watching an analog horror series, so of course, something terrible happens. Okay, hopefully this isn't too cold. No, it's okay. There he is. He's definitely a growing boy, that's for sure. And you're both looking really good. Oh, I love hearing that. Let's get some measurements to see exactly, yeah. exactly how much he's grown. <gasps> what was that? I don't know. I've never seen that before. Maybe something to do with the power. The nurse struggles to find the baby. She reassures Tiffany that it must just be a problem with the machine, and she leaves to find another one. As she exits the room, we can hear her talking to another doctor who might have just experienced the same event with another patient. All while Tiffany sobs in the room, alone. You know what? Why don't we just see if we can borrow another machine, okay? There has to be something wrong with this one. I'll be right back. Um, okay. What are you talking about? No, 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 no. Another short tape, but attentive viewers will notice that it has no shortage of clues. During this tape, we get shown two newspaper articles. The first is shown very briefly in a blink and you'll miss it moment when the baby disappears, and the other is shown at the very end of the video. The first article reads, Bizarre events leave Berkshire in terror, authorities mute. This article seems to detail the multiple break-ins witnessed in tape 4, with the mentions of the Massachusetts emergency broadcast as well as the events leaving an unknown amount of people dead. The second newspaper article is about Tiffany, the woman who went in for the ultrasound, and how she killed herself afterwards not being able to deal with the loss of her unborn son. It's kind of hard to make out the full transcript of the newspaper clipping, but what I learned is this. Tiffany was an elementary school teacher and was 29 at the time of her death. After the mysterious disappearance of her son Maxwell Marsh during the ultrasound, she struggled with the loss and could not live with the heartache. We also learned that she was born in 1958 and that the man she was dating was named Alexander Marsh, who you might remember as Alexander Michael Marsh, the patient being addressed all the way back in tape 3. Also, before the baby disappears, we get another frame of this strange, masked face that popped up in the previous tape. It seems that whatever this thing is, it is important to the events occurring and might even be responsible. With this newfound information, we now have some connections between the tapes we have witnessed so far, and another important fact to note is that since Tiffany was born in 1958 and died at the age of 29, 
that would mean that she died in 1987, presumably the same year of the Berkshire County break-in incident. All these details begin to put the pieces in place for what is to come. Strange things are happening in the state of Massachusetts, but why? Well, to end off this segment, let's look at the description of the video and what it has to tell us, because this is the first time it's had anything to say. It reads, Do you know what they did up there? These are the consequences. With that, let's move right on into the next tape, titled, Sleeping Dogs. Humanity has spent tirelessly past through a great many trials of the 1840s to achieve one singular goal. A goal that countless men withered away and dying in pursuit of, leaving their towers of work behind to be climbed by coming generations. Higher and higher, they were said, so that we were at last reached the one called God. And there, on his apex of infinite knowledge and power, we would approach and look him in the eye. The description of tape six reads There came a red flash as it pitched from heaven. Corruption wrought truth. Zero seven. Zero 07. The tape begins with audio taken from a seminar on October 4th, 1981, given by Dr. Bernard Hayes in New York City. If we look into the background of the video, we can see the letters NACT, which stand for North American Council of Thought. The seminar is about psychology and the manifestation of consciousness. This makes sense because, as we know, Dr. Bernard Hayes was the leading researcher on thought forms who helped Unit 13 create the thought form manifester in the 1990s. Dr. Bernard has some interesting takes, to say the least, but the seminar cuts off and the tape transitions to a Simeodyne user interface. Welcome back, user. Frank Porter. Please enter your credentials. Credential requirement bypassed by system administrator. Greetings, but no user ID. The computer addresses the user as Frank Porter, but when the computer asks for the user to enter their credentials, the command is overridden, and we find that whoever is accessing this computer is an unknown user. I think that this brings us back all the way to that first tape where the same thing happens. We know that whoever may be accessing these files is not Frank Porter as the computer address, but rather an unknown person accessing Frank Porter's computer files. The computer addresses Frank Porter as the project director for a Simeodyne operation that we are not yet aware of. Luckily, Frank has a collection of messages saved into his computer sent by a man named Paul Morelli, who was the founder of the Morelli Construction and Mining Company. It seems that Paul was hired by Frank for the construction of a quote-unquote redacted facility. During the span of a week from March 24th to March 30th, Paul sent nine audio messages to Frank via phone call. It is also worth noting that the year these messages were sent was, could you guess it, 1987. Gosh, that was just a jam-packed year for these people, wasn't it? Damn. And although the name and purpose of the facility was redacted, I think we can guess what it was and what it was used for. After access is granted, the computer begins a playback of Paul's messages. Let's have a listen. Message 1. March 24th, 11.14 a.m. Hey Frank, it's Paul Murray. We ran into somewhat of an issue today. We came across these tunnels inside the mountain, pretty deep in, but, uh, well, this is gonna sound a little crazy, but he told me to call if anything strange came up, and, uh, I figured this qualifies. People have been here before. Some obviously man-made shit in there, like carvings and stone. This shit looks ancient, like real old. I took a crew in to look through it, but it seems part of the tunnels caved in some time ago. We're gonna just have to bust through it regardless. But I still wanted to make you aware of it. Anyways, I'll keep you moving. Thanks. 
The first message starts out normal enough, with Paul calling Frank and letting him know that they have found something interesting during their work. They have found tunnels inside of the mountain that they are working on, and I think we can assume that the mountain these men are working on is, in fact, Mount Greylock. Since it's the main focus of the series, of course. Inside the tunnels, carvings in the stone are found. It appears that people have either lived or visited these tunnels all the way back in the ancient times of man. Paul tells Frank that they are going to continue exploring, and the message ends. Message 2. March 25th, 7.38 a.m. Hey Frank, it's Paul. Just calling to tell you the day might be a bit slower than usual. Unfortunately, a number of the crew are sick as dogs. Not, uh, not really sure what kind of stomach bugs going around or what, but we'll do our best to pick up slack. I'm calling in some guys who have a day off, so uh, hopefully things will get a little closer to normal, you know? That being said, I don't know how the hell this happened, but the section of the tunnel where I caved in is clear. The tunnel's been wired up with a few lights, too. Wanted to see if maybe you sent someone in while we were all shift. In the second message, Paul makes sure to tell Frank that their operation will be a little bit slow today, as most of the men have come down with some sort of illness. The most interesting thing, though, is that it appears that the tunnels have been wired up with lights. I mean, not too weird on its own, but we learn that Paul asked his crew who installed the lights, and nobody knew. Even the night crew was oblivious. But a few miners did say that they saw something, not to do with the lights, no, but something running around in the tree line, keeping its distance, observing the crew. But a few of the guys said they seen something running around in the woods, surrounding the site. I think it's probably a deer or whatever, but seeing all the ruckus we're making out here, you know? But they all insisted it was something else. Something like a, a real tall man. Might just be some environmentalist moron trying to cause some shit, but... You know, he ain't done nothing, so I told him to keep focused on the project. For safety's sake, we're gonna avoid the tunnel until I get back from you. Alright, bye now. The tape ends with Paul saying that he will avoid the tunnel until further notice. Message 3 was recorded about 10 hours later on the same day, and we learned that Frank, the project director, had sent a man out to take pictures of the tunnels. And when he came back, he was extremely ill. As Paul explains, they practically had to carry the man back to his car. But as the crew pushes forward into the mine, Paul tells Frank that they found ancient artifacts within the tunnel. One man on the crew named Arnold Rivers used to work as an archaeologist, and as told by Paul, will be writing a report to send to Frank, seeing as he knows more about the artifacts than Paul does. Message 3 ends. The next message is sent the following day in the afternoon, and Paul is noticeably on edge. Frank, something ain't right here. Crew's getting worse, more sick. I, I feel okay so far, but I, I don't know how long that's gonna last. I saw that thing the guys have been talking about last night, stalking around in the tree line. I swear it had a face. The next message only gets worse. The crew's food seems to have gone rotten for no reason, and Paul is desperate for a response from Frank. All our food is rotten, totally spoiled and covered in maggots. It was perfectly fine and stored, there wasn't any problems with the generator, even if we lost power. I mean, it's the end of March. All our food looks like it's been left out in the heat for weeks. No idea what's going on. Please call me back. Message 6. March 27th, 4.02 p.m. Message 6 is taken on the same day as Message 5 in the evening. After seeing the creature in the tree line once again, the crew decides to set up hunting cameras to see if they can capture any footage of it. It ain't no animal either. Who are you guys gonna put up those fancy hunting cameras and see if we can catch anything? Maybe locals fucking with us? I don't know. We'll, we'll figure it out. But yeah, anyways, I, I just... <laughs> Thank you.
Message 7 has an error for its time and date, and it causes the computer to glitch, showing us a red screen with the text Unit 13 on top of the screen, which all but confirms that this construction project was for the Unit 13 facility. We then cut to more hunting footage as we see what appears to be mist pass by the screen, which could mean that we just witnessed a thought form? The next night, Paul calls Frank again. Desperation and fear can be heard in his voice. The phone lines are dead, all except for Frank's answering machine, almost as if he planned for this to happen. And it would appear that whatever sickness has been going around the crew has finally reached Paul. Paul declares that he will investigate the tunnel out of fear of what will happen if he doesn't. And we transition to more hunting cam footage. Up from any number we tried, but we picked up. No answer machines either. We had a call to the hospital and the same thing. Just ringing. Just tried 911. Still nothing. I figured the phones were fucked up, but the machine actually picked up. <laughs> I think I caught whatever's going around. My skin, it feels, feels tight, a lot of pressure behind my eyes, my, my teeth feel like they're, they're humming, they're vibrating. You know what? I just all started when we came across that tunnel. I, I feel like it, I need to figure out what's down there. I think whatever's down there could help my crew, but most of all, I feel like something really bad's gonna happen if I don't go down, so... The footage seems to be losing its focus, but we can quickly realize that that is not the case, as we see some sort of entity move by the camera. Message 9 was sent on the 30th of March, 1987, and it has no time listed. The computer tells us that this is the end of our messages, and we cut back to more hunting cam footage, and we see this. That damn face. The face of the tall man. Let's get this out of the way. Frank is suspicious. The fact that he instructed Paul to only get in contact with him if they find anything leads me to believe that Frank knew that they were going to find something in that mountain. This coupled with the fact that when Paul and the other men are all ill and presumably dying, no other phone calls go through except for the one made to Frank. I think it's safe to say that Frank and Simeodyne as a whole are a corrupt government organization that sent these men into that mountain to die. They let the sleeping dogs lie. They didn't interfere. They didn't help them. We also get a glimpse of the mysterious face that we have seen for the last few episodes. 
I think I'm going to refer to this thing as the Tall Man going forward, seeing as that is the name that the mining crew started giving it when they first saw it. At the beginning of the video, we also got the seminar with Dr. Bernard Hayes, and we found out that while he's a very smart researcher, he seems to be almost power hungry talking about staring into the eyes of God as an equal. So with all that being said, I think it's fair to say that we have a lot on our plate at the moment. And while I could get into all of what we've witnessed right here, I'm going to keep moving on for the sake of time. So let's go ahead and move into tape seven, which is actually really short and segues perfectly into tape eight. So I'm just going to combine them for this segment of the video. Authorities continue to investigate the recent crime wave that swept across northern Berkshire County, with many of its residents in a state of anxiety and panic. Tape 7 is titled Back to Normal and begins with a news broadcast hosted by Don Wright, who is reporting to the public two weeks after the break-in incident that took place in Berkshire County. Don says that the police have identified the group as an anti-American militia group operating out of Massachusetts, but conveniently, the name of this group has been left out of the tape, seeing as the broadcast itself seems to be heavily distorted. ...of individuals who had been targeting and breaking into people's homes. Authorities have since confirmed that the attacks were, in fact, part of an organized criminal effort and have been attributed to a local anti-American militia group operating out of western Massachusetts called... If it wasn't obvious already, the broadcast seems to be blatantly lying to its viewers, probably to minimize panic. As Don continues to reassure the viewer, something strange happens. Thankfully, due to the continued efforts of law enforcement, life has been able to return back to normal. Back, back to normal. To no back to normal. To normal. To normal. To normal. To normal. <laughs> normal for residents of Berkshire County. During this segment, we get a flash of a photograph that depicts Tiffany and Alexander with the caption that reads, Engaged couple Alex Marsh, 28, and Tiffany Crisaldi, 26, sit together as they discuss the baffling loss of their unborn son. This obviously depicts Tiffany and Alexander after tape 5, when their son vanished from Tiffany's stomach. Right after this though, we get a very easy to miss flash of text that seems to be from a newspaper article. It is hard to make out, but it seems to be discussing a man named Jim Melgren, a former police officer who now works as a private investigator. The text reads, These events are only the tip of the iceberg says Jim Melgren, a former police officer who now works as a private investigator and hosts a radio show centered around government transparency and accountability. There are horrifying reports of people, healthy, grown adults, becoming deformed, growing extra limbs, teeth growing out of their scalp, people developing serious mental conditions, or even... After this flash, Don assures us that everything is going back to normal before we zoom in on his mangled face with the word liar being displayed just off to the right. Yeah, uh, tape 7 is very short, but it is interesting nonetheless. In this tape we get an update to the break-in incident, and we also get a photo of Alex and Tiffany, as well as a very brief introduction to a new character known as Jim Meldrin, who is a retired police officer turned private investigator, who seems to host a radio show where he talks about the government and its accountability. He also seems intimately familiar with the events happening in Greylock citing reports of people becoming deformed and that something just isn't right. Jim Melgren is a new character to us, but I feel he might become one of the most important characters of the series. 
The fact that he is an investigator and has knowledge about the government corruption surrounding Mount Greylock seems to suggest that he might be the person who has been extracting these files that we are viewing. All I'll say is this, we need to keep him in mind going forward, but for now, let's move on to tape 8, which actually starts exactly where tape 7 ends. If you were to edit the end of tape 7 with the beginning of tape 8, you would find that they flow perfectly into each other. Well that broadcast went completely tits up, didn't it? I've been getting chewed out by our asshole CIA liaison for the past two hours. What the fuck happened? We're looking into it, sir, but we experienced no issues with the broadcast on our end, so our engineers believe that the signal was hijacked before we even reaching the transmitter, but once we started receiving phone calls from viewers, we switched to a backup transmitter. But by then, the hijacker had already said everything they wanted to say, hadn't they? Mm, yes, sir. What a complete... Fuck up! They made us look like a fucking joke! I'm sure in our most popular show. Speaking of which, Don, where the fuck is he? I can't get hold of him, and he needs to get in here and read a statement to help clean up this fucking mess. Uh, well, we've been trying to reach him. We've called him multiple times. We've tried his pager. We've asked around to see if anyone's heard from him. Tape 8 begins with a GBS executive named Alan scolding two producers for the news broadcast that we had witnessed previously. It seems that the signal was hijacked and the broadcast we saw last played for all of the viewers who tuned in at home as well. We also learn that Alan, the GBS executive, has been trying to reach Don so that he can read a statement and put the public back at ease but Don doesn't seem to be picking up his phone. Alan tells one of the producers to go to Don's house so that they can get him in the studio, as they have very powerful the people who are depending on them to manage the public's response. You have been to his house? Uh, well, no, I just thought that maybe he'd be upset if I did that. Get in your fucking car and go to his fucking house! I don't care if you kick down his front door and drag him here by his ear. You bring him into the studio. Do you understand? Yes, Mr. Rosenbaum. Of course, I'll do that right now. There's some real powerful people depending on us right now. They need us to manage the response to these events, to let the public know what's going on, and the last thing we need is it going wider than it already fucking has. So do what you need to do, or I'm going to replace you with some producers who actually know how to produce a fucking show! We then transition once again to a computer where a file is attempting to be extracted. However, the file seems to be destroyed. In the middle of this extraction though, the computer opens a file and says that it should not exist. And when the user proceeds to open the file, it seems to contain the personal log from Arnold Rivers, who was the archaeologist from Tape 6 who worked with Paul in the mining operation. Arnold goes on to describe his time in the mining project and what he and the mining crew found in the tunnels. I will go ahead and let this segment play for you to get its full effect. My name is Arnold Eugene Rivers. The date is April 8th, 1987, about a quarter past nine at night. I was involved in the Morelli construction project at Mount Greylock. I was hired due to my background in anthropology and archaeology. I've worked to excavate a number of different historical sites. Paul Morelli took me on after securing a government contract for the Greylock project. I'm recording this because I believe my life is in danger and I likely don't have a lot of time left, so I need to leave some kind of record of my findings. On March 24th, our crew came across tunnels in the mountain that had a multitude of ancient markings and artifacts. On March 25th, Paul cleared the interior of the mountain and asked me, accompanied by a small crew, to look through the tunnels and record notes on what I was able to recognize. I was then to report to one of the project directors, named Frank Porter, to offer my perspective on our findings. I kept this to myself at the time, but what we discovered in that mountain was not normal. Not only did I see the impact it was having on the crew, but certain aspects of my findings did not make any sense. Many of the artifacts were pre-colonial. Some were from Native American tribes, but 
There were other artifacts. Some Mesoamerican and others were shockingly Clovis in nature. Finding Clovis artifacts here means that people have been coming to Mount Greylock since at least 11,000 BCE. But that's not all, no. There are artifacts I found that could potentially be from even earlier Paleo-American cultures that we have yet to even begin studying. Then, there were artifacts and writings left by the cultures that were pre-Columbian in nature. We learn from Arnold that the artifacts found within the mountain date back to some of the earliest moments in human history, and it would seem that a multitude of cultures had visited the mountain for generations. An amazing discovery, no doubt, but it begs the question, why? Why would so many people across so many cultures and generations come to this mountain? Arnold also says that it seems the artifacts have been brought to the mountain as offerings. But to what exactly? The tape then transitions to a program titled Cosmic Mysteries with a segment about the moon's creation. I can't really give a proper reason as to why this is shown just yet, but I do have some theories about its inclusion that I will get to later on. After this, we cut to a phone call. Adam, Police Department, Dispatcher Carey speaking. Um, yes, I'm calling to report a break-in at my co-worker's house. What is your name, sir? My name is Liam Hollander. Okay, Liam, you said this was your co-worker's house. What is your co-worker's address? Uh, it's uh, Parker, Parker Hill Road in Adams, uh, number 491. 491 Parker Hill Road, is that right? Yes. Okay, can you tell me, is anybody hurt? Liam, are you still with me? Yes, sorry. Is anybody hurt? Yes. <laughs> The call comes from the producer who was sent to get Don back in the studio, and the call is made to the Adams Police Department. And when the dispatcher asks if anyone is hurt, we get this image. Don has been murdered, and it would seem that the image we saw at the end of the broadcast was actually just a dark foreshadowing of his eventual demise. We cut back to Arnold, who is still discussing more findings within the mountain that point to a darker conclusion of what the mountain was actually used for. Then I witnessed many altars constructed out of the mountain stone, along with evidence of mass animal and human sacrifice. And the carvings in the walls of these sacrificial chambers, I couldn't recognize a single familiar symbol, and it, it made me sick to even look at them. Let me be clear, I am not, nor have I ever been, a religious man, but there's something in that mountain, S something people of countless cultures over the history of our planet have been worshipping, but I don't know why, but I could feel it, whatever's down there, I could feel it, it was like being trapped in a fever dream, I swear I could hear a voice and even felt compelled to go further, to speak to whatever's down there. I don't know. I, I don't know. I, I haven't been right since I, I keep hearing this droning in my head. He describes that he hasn't felt right since exploring the tunnels, and has had a painful droning in his head ever since, as well as a horrible sense of paranoia and fear for his life after filing a report to Frank Porter, the project director from Tape 6. Being the intelligent man that he is, Arnold has decided to never return to the mountain, but at the cost of what could be his own safety. We abruptly cut to another file detailing the state of those who survived the Morelli mining incident. We are shown many before and after photos of the men who worked on the project, and, well, it is not pretty. I wasn't going to return to the site. He insisted I did, said I was a valuable asset to the project, even offered me a substantial raise, and wanted me to lead a specifically organized team that would clear the tunnels of artifacts before excavation would continue. 
I, quote unquote, could be responsible for the biggest historical finding of all time, he said. I refuse again. I won't put a price on my sanity or my health, especially after seeing what was happening to the crew. Now loading. Morali Greylock event. Group C. Survivor data. Profile for patient B3590. Rockford, Thomas. Al formations. Notes. Communicative. Patient prone to spontaneous violent outbursts. Treatment of heavy sedation recommended. Only communicate while patient is restrained or via intercom. Many of them still retain a former image of themselves, while other have mutated into full-blown cannibalistic monsters. Profile for patient. B8816. Fleming, Charles. Al formations. Notes. Uncommunicative. Warning. Patient will attack on sight. Do not interact. Immunity to pain. Patient exhibits cannibalistic tendencies. All treatments ineffective. Immediate euthanasia recommended. One patient will just sit up randomly and projectile vomit a toxic substance onto anyone in the vicinity. But in my opinion, I think the worst of these cases has to be that of Scott O'Kirst, who has enough intelligence to act friendly and benevolent, but only in a way that makes his victims let their guard down so that he can cannibalize them. This ended up getting six staff members killed, all while he laughed hysterically. Who these staff members were working for is a little bit of a question. It could just be some hospital or maybe even Simeodyne, but uh, we, we really don't know because it's not confirmed. For most of the patients, immediate euthanasia is recommended, and I think we can all agree that Arnold made the right choice leaving the mountain. He then goes on to describe the strange things that have been happening around the mountain as a result of the mining project. In my second refusal, wished me luck in my future endeavors, but before I could say anything else, he hung up. But it seemed I'd made the right choice. I heard something awful happened up at Mount Greylock, and then simultaneously, there were all of these things that have been happening around the mountain. The home invasions, the dead bodies that fell from the sky over Cheshire, the pregnancy phenomena, so many other unexplainable things. They all must be related, and I've been trying to figure out how. I've connected with a local investigator who's been trying to get to the bottom of this. I've shared with him everything I have, though I feel that I've been being watched. He then explains that he has gotten in touch with an investigator to help him put the pieces together about what's really happening in Mount Greylock, as well as what the government might be hiding from the people. Arnold then goes on to describe a day where he came home and his door was unlocked. Then. In a scene straight out of a nightmare, we hear a door open from inside Arnold's house. Watched. I feel a looming threat that I can't really explain. Would the government really send someone to kill me over this? I feel like I'm paranoid. Like I've lost some of my mind. But I came home from the grocery store the other day and my front door was unlocked. And I know I had locked it before I left. I scanned my entire house for traces of anything, but found nothing out of the ordinary. I even checked and replaced all of the light bulbs. <laughs> oh god. Saying it out loud like this, it makes me realize how crazy I sound. I've always been a rational man. There's a logical explanation behind everything. Arnold hides in his closet, he instructs anyone who finds this tape, and his files, to get in touch with Jim Melgren, the investigator whose name was brought up briefly in the newspaper in the last episode. And then he stops talking, and we hear movement in Arnold's home. They're here! I'm inside my bedroom closet! I'm going to keep the tape recorder running, and I'm hiding in here with my files. If something happens to me, and you find any tapes or files somehow, 
Please, bring it to the investigator, Jim Malcolm North Adams. That goes for this video footage as well. Come on out, it's the police. <laughs> There's that face again. The tall man opens up the closet and kills Arnold. This episode gave us a lot of information and context. Let's start off with the tall man. This entity has been a huge mystery to us from the earliest parts of the series, but at this point I think it's safe to say that this thing does in fact have intelligence and has a thought capacity for strategy. When Arnold hears the door open in his home, he says that it is the basement door which means this thing was in his home already. This coupled with the fact that when Arnold came home and his front door was unlocked a few days prior, my theory is that this thing broke into his house, hid in the basement, and then killed him when the time was right. It seems that it can also mimic voices, strangely enough. An absolutely terrifying tool for luring prey. As for whether it is connected to Simeodyne or Unit 13, it is hard to say but it would make sense as a tool that the company uses to silence those who gain too much knowledge. We also get a reference to the break-ins and the disappearing babies, as well as an event I don't believe we have witnessed yet. An account of dead bodies falling from the sky over Cheshire. But one thing is for sure, it all connects back to the mountain. We also see the mutations of those who quote-unquote survived the mining incident, seeing what their illness actually did to them in the end. And we also learn what the tunnels in the mountain were actually used for. There is still a lot happening under the surface though that I can't quite put together at this time. Things like why Don was killed in his home, or actually who committed the break-ins. But I think one of the biggest things that might have gotten explained to us in this episode was Jim Melgren. I think he is definitely the one who could be extracting the files from Simeodyne facilities in order to gain knowledge on what is really going on up at that mountain. Although if Simeodyne is still active at the time of Arnold's death, which it seems they are, then I think the file extraction we are seeing in the first tape and all the other tapes for that matter are taking place in the future, either in the late 90s or early 2000s, but then again, that's just speculation at this point. But with all this knowledge in mind, let's move on to tape 9, Trojan Technology. Tape 9 begins with the same computer voice that we have heard many times before. The computer grants access to a GBS radio broadcast from December 1963, the earliest date that we have gotten in the series so far. We are told that the radio segment being accessed is the announcement of something called the National Access Initiative. This program was announced during the presidency of Lyndon B. Johnson, whose term ran from 1963 to 1969. In one of his first acts after his historic succession, President Lyndon B. Johnson's administration has announced an upcoming program that will revolutionize communication and bring critical home electronics into every American household. The National Access Initiative, as it's been named, is a program designed to ensure that all citizens have equal access to vital communication tools and ways to stay informed, fostering connectivity, security, and unity across the nation. The goal of the program was to grant every American household at the time with the newest and most innovative technology to revolutionize communication across the United States. 
This program actually fits in well with what LBJ was trying to do during his presidency, as he came up with what is now referred to today as LBJ's Great Society, which was a set of programs launched by President Johnson with the goal of expanding civil rights, public broadcasting, giving Americans access to health care, aid to education, and so on and so forth. So while the program being presented in Greylock didn't actually exist, it is not too far off from something LBJ would seek to accomplish. The program would deliver technology such as telephones, smoke alarms, and radios to eligible households across the nation. It's a pretty great idea, to be honest, but where do you get this technology? Well, that's where our good old pals over at Simeodyne come in. President Johnson himself was quoted as saying that in this era of progress and innovation, it is crucial for every American to have the tools necessary as they navigate the challenges of modern life in an era of ever-increasing technological dependence. These electronics packages are being made available to American households through a partnership with world-renowned technology manufacturer Simeodyne USA. Yes, it seems that Simeodyne has had a partnership with the US government since the early 1960s and maybe even before. After we are told that Simeo Dine has a partnership in this program, we get two newspaper articles. The first one is really hard to make out except for the headline which reads, President Kennedy says no to Simeo Dine USA. And the second article seems to detail Kennedy's assassination. A little suspicious, but why would Kennedy go against Simeo Dine? We cut to a security camera in someone's home in the year of 1966, and then we swiftly transition back to the news broadcast from earlier, which assures the viewers that the technology provided by Simeodyne will be of the highest quality before cutting back to more security footage taking place inside someone's household. And then we see a shot of someone sleeping in their bed. One thing to note is that all of the security footage is taking place in the homes of different time zones, and the shot with a person in their bed is actually taking place in 1967, unlike the first two shots that take place in 1966. What this means is that the reach of this program is pretty massive, stretching across the country, and people are being watched in their homes for what appears to be years. The tape then cuts to audio from a press conference in which Percival C. Roswell, the president of Simeodyne, gives a speech. Let's go ahead and take a listen to what he has to say. When asked for a quote during a press conference earlier this week, President of Simeodyne USA, Percival C. Rothwell, had a lot to say. The National Access Initiative represents a milestone in our nation's journey towards progress and inclusivity. It's a reflection of the American government and Simeodyne USA's unwavering commitment to empower every American citizen, regardless of age, location, or income with the tools and resources needed to thrive in the electronic age. Through the miracle of modern communication, the words we speak, the actions we take, will be read, heard, and seen on the instant, and judged in every city and village in America. They are the silent to delegate. We cannot see them or hear them, but they are present. The speech is honestly pretty convincing, but we the audience know the truth, as we see more camera footage inside the homes of American citizens. In the middle of the speech, the audio cuts to a conversation between Percival C. Roswell and an unknown person. Have a listen. For decades, people of all kinds have wondered what it is we're working on at any given time inside Simeodyne. And for decades, We've kept it all quite secret, but I'll let you in on a little something. I'm here. Kennedy didn't go for it. But you assured me he was available. Or was that just more of your bullshit? Huh? He's gonna fucking expose our whole plan for the NAI program. The meeting couldn't have gone worse. If that fucking nick thinks he's gonna expose Simeon Got another thing coming. But we're not the only ones he's pissed off lately. After rejecting Operation North 
upwards, and then that executive order involving the Federal Reserve, there are a lot of snakes in the grass. And it's about time that Kennedy got bit. At Simeon USA, we're building the future. It seems that after Simeodine met with Kennedy to discuss the initiation of this program, Kennedy turned them away and threatened to reveal the true intentions of their plan to the people of the US. This would of course expose Simeodine and ruin them. And so, they make a decision. And we all know what happened to President Kennedy. The speech resumes and we are shown more security footage of people inside their homes. In the middle of the speech, however, we get a brief flash of what appears to be the face of the tall man that we have seen throughout the series, except this time it's slightly different. For one, it is red rather than white, and it is not cracked like the mask we have seen previously, so I'm not even sure if this is actually the same creature from before or something else entirely although it is weird that it is overlaid with the president's face. We then cut to security footage taken all the way into 1990 that appears to depict a whiteboard with the following text. The NAI program is a trap. They are watching. They are listening. Fuck LBJ. Fuck Simeodine. I won't be your lab rat anymore. It seems that the NAI program was in operation for many years, and some people actually found out what was going on under the surface. In the next instance of security footage, we see a person's shadow as well as a closet door opening. This is dated to take place in 1993, the same year Simeodyne began development on the Thoughtform Manifestor. Then the applause from the crowd cut off this footage, and we get a picture of many masked and cloaked individuals in the forest. Interesting. We then cut back to the broadcast that continues to give us information about the NAI program's reach, and then we cut to more security footage dated December 29th, 1994. This is the farthest date in the series that has been explicitly given to us. During the footage, a dark entity rises from the shadows and begins speaking to a girl named Katie. The following sequence is disturbing, to say the least. Here you are. 
Since this event takes place in the 90s, around the same time of the Thought Form Manifestor's creation, I don't think I am wrong when I say that this imaginary friend was actually a Thought Form. We cut back to the broadcast and we are told that the rolling out of this technology will take place sometime during 1966 and 1967, which matches up with the few instances of security footage that we saw earlier. We then cut to more security footage, yes, there's a, there's a lot, taken in 1987, a year we are all too familiar with at this point. The phone rings, but no one picks up, causing a message to activate. Hello, you've reached Alex Marsh and Tiffany Crisaldi. We're not able to get to the phone, so please leave a message after the tone and we'll get back to you as soon as we can. And we learn that this is the household of Alexander Marsh and Tiffany Crisaldi. The tape ends. So, let's see. What did we learn? In this tape, we saw just how powerful Simeodyne is and how far their reach is as well, seeing as they had a strong partnership with the US government. So much so that they directly or indirectly orchestrated Kennedy's assassination. We also got a hint that Tiffany and Alexander might become more important later on in the story. We also got some images of some cloaked figures and masks, and uh, it's just all so confusing at this point. So many details are coming together to create something that is truly, truly confusing. Um, but please, once again, I will say, you just have to stick with me on this one, because I'm going to explain all of these things as best as I can after we move through each tape. And speaking of the tapes, we only have three left at this point, so I think we should just keep moving on. It's time to move into one of the longest tapes of the series. It's titled Messages from the Dead, and it clocks in at 20 minutes, and honestly, is one of the best in the series. There is also another really short tape directly after this one, so to save time, I'm just going to move through both of these tapes simultaneously before we move on to tape 12, which, as it stands now, is the final tape that we have to cover. And since this is the longest tape that we have so far, I'm going to move through it decently quickly, as this video is already getting uh, very long, so be sure to pay attention. But without further ado, Let's move on into tape 10, Messages from the Dead. The tape begins in the forest. The cameraman wanders around for a small moment until they come across the lifeless carcass of a rat, and they decide to examine it. Something I found immediately perplexing just right off the bat is how this person seems to be wearing the same gloves of the person who opened the window all the way back in tape 4, and I'm not sure if this is supposed to be telling us that this is the same person, but it is an interesting detail nonetheless. The footage then cuts to the same phone and clock that the last tape ended with, and for the first time, we hear the voice of Alexander Marsh. Hey babe, I'm just checking in. Could you please give me a call as soon as you can? Don't worry about work either, please. You're way more important, okay? Okay. I love you. Bye. We cut to a video of Alexander answering questions in an interview about the day Tiffany was found dead. 
We cut back to the phone, and we see that the time has moved about 40 minutes since Alexander's first message. This corresponds to what Alexander was talking about while he was in the room being interviewed. It seems that after their baby mysteriously disappeared, he would call home each day to check on Tiffany. As we all know, she took the loss extremely hard, eventually killing herself. We both took it hard, but I was just really worried about Tiffany. She seemed to only be getting worse this time. She spent a lot of time by herself. When it came time for me to return to work, we decided I would call home every day during my lunch break just so we could talk and check in on each other. She always picked up the phone whenever I called. She knew it would worry me sick if she didn't pick up the phone. Tiffany, babe, I still haven't heard from you. Hope everything is okay. You're probably just busy doing something, but we've been talking every day since I've been back to work, so... You know, just, I'm getting a bit worried, so please call me back, okay? Love you. After this message, we cut to footage of what I can only assume to be some kind of ritual? Man, what is happening in this series? Candles light a dark room, illuminating a strange symbol etched on the floor. After this, we cut back to the phone and hear Alexander's final message before he presumably rushed home and found Tiffany dead. Okay, I'm not sure what's going on, but I'm gonna head home. I'm sorry, I'm just... I'm kind of freaking out. I'll be there soon. I love you. After this, the video cuts to a login prompt for the Massachusetts office of the chief medical examiner. We then hear the account of Dr. Heinrich Albrecht, the medical examiner who conducted the autopsy of Tiffany's body after she was found dead. An interesting detail that I took note of is that when the doctor attempts to say Tiffany's age, he first says that she was 28 which we know is incorrect because it doesn't match the article that detailed Tiffany's death all the way back in tape 5, and at the same time, the tape noticeably glitches when he mentions her age. And this leads me to believe that Tiffany's age may hold some kind of significance to the story, but at this time, I, I'm not sure what it could be. May 19th, 1987, 3.23 p.m. Integrate report for Tiffany Elaine Marie Crisaldi. Caucasian female, age 28, 29, 26, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, as the doctor begins to describe the state of Tiffany's body, we get another weird and honestly terrifying glitch. H-A. This autopsy will be conducted at the request of the Adams Police Department. Initial external evaluation reveals a resinous black substance adhered to the face neck and upper thoracic region. We learn that Tiffany's body is not in any condition that one would consider normal. A black substance has adhered to her face, seemingly coming out of her eyes and nose. Her eyes are fully retracted and a strange symbol has been carved into her skin below the sternum. After some analysis, Dr. Heinrich comes to the conclusion that this symbol was added post-mortem meaning that Tiffany didn't carve the symbol herself, seeing as she had been dead for several hours. This is starting to sound less like a suicide, and more like a murder. We then cut to what I can only assume to be a therapy session between Tiffany, who is at the age of six, and an unknown doctor who begins to question her about her birthday. Okay, Tiffany, we're recording now. Okay. So, Tiffany, you just had your sixth birthday, didn't you? Yeah. Did you have a party? Yeah. How was it? Good. That's good. You're awfully quiet today. Are you seeing them again? Yes. Can you see them right now? 
Yeah. This is an interesting segment that will return in this video later. The only thing I can really take note of right now is that the doctor's name and just identity is completely erased from this interview, which is interesting. There's also the fact that the doctor asks Tiffany if she can see them, which is a little strange, almost as if she's seeing some sort of apparition in the room with them. It'll come back later, trust me, but uh, let's just move on for now. Cutting back to Dr. Heinrich, who is recording a private log for his home archives, he speaks about a strange incident that happened involving his examination of Tiffany. And to get the full effect of just how strange this situation and honest to God creepy it was, I am just going to let this segment play for you now. Private log for case file 87-091-HA for my home archives. The date is May 19, 1987. Time is 8.03 p.m. I conducted an examination of Miss Tiffany Crisaldi today. Her body arrived shortly before I was to leave the office for the day, but I decided to at least begin external examinations. Though it seems misfortune loomed over the proceedings, Electrical flickers and inexplicable drops and spikes in room temperature. Ah, repairs may be required. I wanted to refrain from mentioning this part whatsoever, but... But I feel compelled to do so. After placing Miss Crisaldi in storage and moving on to cleaning up, my sister Sarah mentioned that she'd heard what sounded like a woman crying, coming from the direction of the cooler. I shrugged off her remark and let her leave early, telling her she was likely stressed or overtired, and I continued cleaning up on my own. I didn't dare to tell her that I heard it as well. We are shown the cooler and we hear exactly what the doctor was talking about. We hear the cries of a woman who has been dead for several hours. We cut back to the therapy session where Tiffany and her doctor are beginning an exercise. The doctor starts up some relaxing music and begins directing Tiffany on what he wants her to do. He tells Tiffany to imagine that she is standing outside of her house on a sunny day, alone with nothing but the big blue sky, the grass, the trees, and the house. He tells her to begin walking towards the front door of her house, narrating her every step. Moon calms down now, and you begin walking very slowly towards the front door of your house. Step. 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 And with each step you take, it looks like the day is getting later and later. Soon the golden rays of the sunset are shining against your house. The front door is closer now, but you still have some more steps to go. Step. 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 He says that with each step she takes, the day begins to darken around her as the sun dives from the sky. He then instructs Tiffany to open the door and step into her house. He tells her that her house looks like it always does at night. Everything is tidy and in its proper place, and it even smells the same, but she is alone. In fact, the doctor goes to great lengths to make sure that she knows just how alone she is, but that all changes when she reaches her bedroom. When Tiffany opens the door to her room, she finds a door next to her window. She describes it as standing black with strange symbols carved into the wood. The doctor tells Tiffany 
to open the door, even if she is scared. The music stops, and we hear what Tiffany finds on the other side of the door. Walk to the door and open it. I'm scared. It doesn't matter if you're scared. You must open the door. Good job, Tiffany. Now tell me what's on the other side of the door. It's a small room. Somebody's in there. No, Tiffany, you're alone. No. No. There's someone here. He's facing away from me. He's standing and tall. He's very tall. Tiffany, you are alone. Nobody else is there. Now tell me what else is in the room. There's a TV. The screen is all fuzzy. And the tall man is watching it. Tiffany, I want you to focus on removing the man from your mind. When I snap my fingers, he will be gone. You will be alone. The man's shaking. His body is cracking. Okay, Tiffany, I'm going to count down from five. When I snap my fingers, you will return to the real world. Five, you're feeling more awake He's now. turning around. Four, everything around you is becoming He's amazing. looking at me. He sees me. Three, Tiffany, you can feel the chair you're sitting in again. Two, everything around you fades to the blackness behind you. One, full control of your body. Zero, we're awake, Tiffany. You'll return to reality now. This description reminds me of someone we've seen before. We then cut back to the rat found in the forest. The person who found the rat begins to cut open its stomach and pulls out an audio tape. The person inserts it into the audio player and we get this message. We don't know who sent this message, but it is addressed to Jim Melgren, the private investigator who has been behind the scenes throughout the entire series. Another thing to take note is that the video that plays over the message has the same symbol that was carved into Tiffany's body after she was killed. And speaking of Tiffany... The tape ends with Tiffany seemingly being resurrected by some unknown force. The description of this video reads, The serpent's right eye was plucked from his head and was transformed, and engulfed in a great flame that fashioned to provide light for all creation. And lo, it was made to nourish the earth so that life might thrive and flourish from it. 
This takes us to tape 11, titled Preparations for a Guest, and this is an interesting one because after the last tape, it is very short and doesn't fit in with anything we have witnessed so far. It starts with a GBS broadcast on basement renovation before cutting to video footage of what I think is a basement. The person recording focuses on this door that has a mechanism for keeping it closed and locked. One of the interesting things is that it is overlaid with footage of this strange ritual that we caught a glimpse of earlier. This leads me to believe that this might be the location of that ritual, and the video is showing us this person's security measures to keep anyone from interrupting said ritual. At the end of the video, the person recording pulls out a tape player. They rewind the tape, hit play, and we are greeted with the sounds of someone weeping and saying that they're sorry in a very distorted tone. The video's description reads, What you so fear, so I am. While this tape is interesting, I still have no idea what to actually make of it, I'm gonna be honest guys. This seems to be the location of the ritual that was teased to us in the previous episode, but what that ritual is exactly has me a little perplexed. But if I had to assume, I would say that this is the ritual that was used to resurrect Tiffany in the previous tape. But the person recording is preparing for something, but we just don't get to know what it is yet. This tape got me excited for what was to come next in the series, and little did I know that while writing this video, tape 12 would be dropped. And while it seems that the series is still a long way from answering our questions, this next tape might be my favorite that we have gotten in the series so far. So after all of this tape watching and all of this theorizing, all of this information gathering, We've made it to the final and longest tape of the series. Let's go ahead and review it. Tape 12 is titled, Waking Your Subconscious. The video begins much like Tape 3 did, with a warning that states the following tape is intended for the sole use of a person named Charlotte Jean Melgren, a person who shares the same last name as the investigator we have caught references to in the previous videos. We can also figure out that this tape was manufactured by Simeodyne in 1993, again, much like Tape 3. We also get a health warning that states the following. Participation in this part of the TF system may result in the viewer achieving a heightened sensory state. This can cause the viewer to experience unexpected visual and auditory occurrences that have no discernible source. We are then told that we will need a TF system neurovisor headset, as well as our workbook and a writing utensil to continue. We are welcomed by the same AI voice in Tape 3. Greetings, and welcome to the second video program in the Preconditional Protocols and Orientation Video System for Unit 13, TF2, Waking Your Subconscious. It appears that this is the second tape in the TF System Orientation Protocols series that Unit 13 is using to prepare willing volunteers for their time in Unit 13. We are told that this tape has been made to utilize powerful psychological stimuli and cutting-edge technology to help Unit 13 get access to the deepest recesses of the participant's mind. We are then shown a checklist for what we will need to do in order to ensure that this works effectively. It recommends that the user is completely alone, has shut off all the lights in their home, and that the audio of the program is at a level where it will block out all outside noise. We are told that this not only allows the participant to focus, but it also allows them to feel fear throughout the program, 
which is essential to the program working as intended. We are then told that it is essential that we do not pause the program while it is active, or else it will carbonite your fucking skull. Well, I'm sure there's nothing to worry about. After this, a countdown begins as the screen gradually turns red, and the program begins. Section 1 begins. It is labeled Induction, and is described as unlocking the gateway to the deeper corridors of our psyche. We get a warning that states the next segment of the video contains flashing lights, and that anyone with photosensitivity should look away from the screen. And believe me when I say this, uh, it's not joking. If you have photosensitivity, I would recommend skipping past this section. I'll put a timestamp on screen so that you can skip to it now. Induction. Please stare at your screen for 30 seconds. The screen flashes red for a few seconds and we are told that our induction is complete. And the video moves on to section 2, which is called priming. The description of this section says that it is preparing our minds for neuroplastic realignment whatever that means. I also wanted to mention that while I was watching the video for the first time, it was at this point that I noticed this shadow figure in the background of the tape. This thing moves closer to us as the tape goes on, and I'm still stuck between wondering if it was intentionally put in the tape by Unit 13 and Symbiodyne, or if it really is just an anomaly slowly inching its way towards us. Either way, it's creepy. At the moment, I think this represents the participants' minds while watching the tape, as it's slowly taken over, and as we will see later on, how the person is actually changing throughout the process. We are then instructed to write down the words that we feel don't belong in the current set. With the first set, I believe rope to be the odd man out. In the second set, I would say blood is the outlier seeing as how the other words are actual organs, like heart. Before we see set 3, the video distorts and we see text that reads, Everything you love will be remade. And then we see a picture of a woman with dogs, and a flash of a newspaper article that details the story of a local Samaritan who opened her home to stray dogs. Then we are shown set 3, and I would say followed is the odd man out. Before seeing set 4, we get another visual glitch and a message stating that love contorts her flesh and bone. Set 4's outlier, I think, is improved because, well, just look at the other words and tell me I'm wrong. As set 5 begins to display its words, we get another visual glitch that flashes the words, Where is your precious daughter, Jim? with another flash for a missing persons poster for Charlotte Melgren. It is now confirmed that the woman addressed in the beginning of the tape is, in fact, Jim's daughter. And it seems that something terrible has happened to her. As for why she's addressed in this Simeodyne manufactured tape for thought form research, it's a little hard to say, especially since her father is the one presumably hacking into all of Simeodyne's computer systems and retrieving their files. I find it hard to believe that he would let her participate in these experiments. I think we have one of two options. Either he is unaware that she did this, or they are working together and Charlotte was sent into Unit 13 to appear as a willing participant to get more information, but that might be stretching it a bit. There is no concrete answer, so let's just go ahead and move on. Set 5's outlier for me has to be you which is a strange word to have paired up with others such as morph and mutate. We then get an incredibly quick flash of camera footage taken by Paul Morelli, seemingly going through the tunnels that were found during the mining project. This happens before we get a warning that tells us unauthorized alterations have been made to the program and that we must not continue otherwise we will experience undesirable consequences. It seems that an error has not been accounted for, but this doesn't stop us from continuing to Section 3, Conditioning, in which we will be tested on how we respond to certain stimuli. We are told that this section is based upon the Stroop test, 
a test that dates back all the way to the 1930s and is still used today. It is used to test the brain's reaction to mismatched information. For example, if I was to display the word red but in the color green and do that over and over and over again to test how quick your brain responds, that would be the Stroop test. But in this tape, instead of words and colors, we have emotions and faces. We are told to state our responses out loud. Hmm. Well, that's not normal. As the faces begin to contort, we get the final expression that reads, Changed. The tape cuts abruptly to live footage taken in 1992 from Ever Virgil security monitoring. After the video glitches, we see something open a door to the kennels of this establishment and we can hear the dogs barking. This seems to be the shelter of the Good Samaritan in the newspaper that was talked about earlier. The door to the kennels slams shut and the power goes out. The dogs fall silent. We cut to a desktop view for a security company and see someone with the last name Erickson log into the computer, followed by a prompt that asks if they want to call the property owner. They accept and we can see that the property owner is Charlotte Melgren. She picks up the phone and we hear this exchange. Uh, yes, hello, this is Troy with Evervigil Security. Am I speaking with Charlotte Melgren? Uh, 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 yeah, yes. What happened this time? Uh, Ms. Melgren, we've detected some unusual activity at Forever Friends Kennels. Our system alerted us that kennel door one was open and enclosed unexpectedly, followed by a power outage. Is it correct that your primary residence is the first unit at Forever Friends? Uh, yeah, y yeah, but... Okay, so I'm not the one who got the security system. It was my dad. So I don't know if there's some way to fix this or whatever, but you guys have called me in the middle of the night like five times in the past couple of weeks, and it's all turned out to be false alarms every time. I, I'm so sorry about that, ma'am. I, I, I can take a look into why that might be happening if you'd like, uh, but first I need to be sure that you're in a safe situation. Are you currently alone? Yeah, it's just me. But I, I'm looking out the window right now, and everything seems fine. I mean... The power's out, but it literally goes out all the time over there, so I'm just going to go flip the breaker. Uh, Ms. Melgren, we strongly advise against going outside or into the kennels, especially with the power outage. We figure out that the security system was installed by her father, probably in an attempt to protect his daughter from the forces he was investigating. As our security employee named Troy asks Charlotte about her current situation, she states that everything is normal, and that even though the power is out, it is not anything out of the ordinary, as this has happened many times before. Charlotte tells Troy that she will just go and switch the breaker herself, as she doesn't want the cops showing up yet again to only find nothing. Troy strongly advises against it, but they end up coming to a compromise to stay on the phone with each other and call the police if anything happens. As Charlotte gets ready to head over to the kennels and switch on the breaker herself, Troy begins to sift through the night's security footage to see if he can find any information. Oh, um, okay, I'm getting an error. It's not letting me review it. Well, I, I can just head over really quick. Like, real quick. Well, there's no motion alert in tonight's log, so... Okay, just... Please be quick and safe. Thank you. Seriously, I'm going to go throw some clothes on and, um, you know, grab the cordless, okay? Yeah, all right. I'll look into the false alarms you mentioned and see if I can figure out what's going on with that. The camera footage comes up with an error, though, and he cannot view it. With this camera playback being uncooperative, he begins to check the previous false alarms that Charlotte spoke about. One shows the kennel door slamming, while many other of the files have been corrupted. 
However, on the 16th, we can clearly see this strange skeleton-like figure crawling across the roof of the kennels. Another shows us the same figure standing outside the door of the kennels before it too receives a playback error. Also, I have to take a moment to say this, but the first thing that came to mind when I saw this thing was the imaginary friend who killed the little girl in Tape 9. They seem to be the same entity, which would suggest that it's not just some thought form, but possibly something more. Also, this sequence is absolutely brilliant and blew me away my first time watching it. The footage mixed with the reactions of Troy and the nonchalant attitude of Charlotte and her yawns just do a great job of building towards a horrible situation that we are about to witness firsthand. Okay, I'm inside. And yep, the power is definitely out. Uh, okay, I'm just gonna go check on the dogs real quick on my way to the basement. But everything seems fine. I'm I'm really not sure this is a good idea, Miss Mogren. Listen, something's wrong with the recording as I'm seeing of your home. What do you, What do you mean wrong? Honestly, I'm I'm not sure exactly what I'm looking at here. It seems like the camera's glitched out or something, but the previous calls you've been getting, they, they weren't false alarms. Yeah, again, I'm not sure what's going on here, but uh, something's been stalking around your property for a while now. I, I'm not sure how the previous people who called you didn't notice. Okay, something like, what, an animal or... No, no, well, I, I don't know, actually. I just, listen, I, I just think you should go back to your house, okay? Please. Okay, okay, yeah, you, you win. Let me just make sure that the dogs are okay, and I'll head back over. They're just right here. Okay, thank you. As Troy tells her about what she is seeing on the cameras, this prompts Charlotte to check on the dogs and get the hell out of there. But something is wrong. I'm going to try to look over tonight's footage again, just in case it's decided to work. Okay. Hi, babies. Hi, Mama. It's... Um... What's wrong? Um... I don't... know. You okay, you okay, buddy? Charlotte? What's going on? The dogs aren't moving. They're all just... standing... here. Well, it's late, so maybe they're just tired or something. The dogs appear to have no reaction to Charlotte's presence and we see the mysterious figure on camera once again, this time entering the kennels while Charlotte is inside. Uh, but let's just get no, you back. not it. They're just standing here, not moving. Like, at all. Like, not even their eyes. It, it's like... Oh my god. It's, it's like they're fucking dead, oh, but they're fuck. not. What the fuck? What? What? Miss Melgren, you need to get out of there and return to your house immediately. I'm sending your information to the police right now. What's going on? Get the hell out of the kennel! Okay. Now! Fuck! Fuck! I'm leaving! What was that? Are you okay? <laughs> Charlotte! Charlotte, are you okay? It, it just... It, it ripped my flashlight. Charlotte? It, it ripped my flashlight. It's gone. It's gone. It's gone. Something... Something ripped it out of my hand. I can't... I can't see anything. Troy sends Charlotte's address to the police, and he urges her to get out as quick as she can. We can hear something else in the room with Charlotte that sounds very similar to the creature from Trojan Technology, and as she moves through the darkness, we learn that she can't find a door. Not because it's pitch black, no, it's because the door has actually disappeared from existence, with nothing but a blank wall and a doormat left behind. When she does find a door, the one that disappeared reappears. <laughs> you need to keep feeling our way out, Charlotte. Don't let anything distract you. Great job, Charlotte. Okay, very good, Charlie. You're doing great. 
but she is still inside and has no idea where she is. Troy, trying to comfort Charlotte in any way he can, tells her to be completely silent as we hear the entity close in. Breathe. You need to try and stay as calm as you possibly can. Listen, if it's that dark, whatever's in there probably can't see you either, okay? So it's important that we stay very quiet until the police arrive. Very quiet. Okay. Okay, good. Okay. Stay right where you are. Keep your back against the wall. All right, the officer's just down the road right now. You're going to be okay. Now, now listen, I'm going to stop talking so we can be completely quiet. But no, I'm still here. I'm not going anywhere until you're safe. Thank you. Thank you. I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. I should have listened to you. It's, it's all okay. We're going to get you out of there. Now, no more talking. This test is made up of five statements. You will check true or false beside the corresponding number for each statement in your workbook. If you do not have your workbook, simply write one through five vertically on a piece of paper. All falls silent, and then Charlotte says that she thinks her skin is moving, before being dragged away from the phone. We then cut back to the TF2 orientation tape, where we are being given a true or false test. Statement 1 asks us if this tape is changing our brain. The answer comes out to be true. Statement 2 tells us only a small percentage of people will never betray their moral values, no matter the situation. The answer comes up as false. The reasoning given to us is that under the right circumstances, it has been proven that anyone is capable of betraying their moral values. Statement 3 states, through your conscious mind, you make your own decisions. And as much as I would like this to be true, the tape tells us that this is false because most decision making happens at an unconscious level. And that the conscious levels of the mind rationalize these decisions after the fact. Statement 4 says, we all have immoral thoughts and desires, but it's critical to focus our energy on the positive aspects of ourselves so that we can be better people. And once again, as much as I would like this to be true, the tape tells us that this is false. According to the tape, the darkest aspects of our minds are part of a larger quote-unquote psychological entity. This shadow entity cannot be reasoned with and it cannot go away. Attempting to get rid of it will do nothing more than make it stronger darker, and more dangerous. This ties back to the second tape of the series with the car radio proclaiming the exact same thing. Statement 5. Opening the door to your shadow psyche and embracing your darkest urges as a part of yourself is the only way to live a fulfilling life. The answer comes up as true. The explanation tells us to open the black door. Testing complete. As this Nosferatu-looking shadow monster takes up our screen, we are told that our testing is complete. Section 5 is dubbed as an awakening sequence that will create a connection between our conscious and unconscious mind. 
We are then shown LSD level imagery that is nearly impossible to make out between a quick flash of a skull, some distorted faces, and a scene ripped straight from Psycho, except from the victim's point of view. But one that really drew my attention was this strange space-like image. Space has been a background element of this series, and I think that this just reinforces that fact that there is definitely some cosmic stuff at play in this story. The next image has a slowed down audio laid over it, and when brought back up to normal speed, it says, But parasites like these, while distressing, are no match for man when he is well organized. And much like many other times I've said in this video, not sure exactly what this could mean, and this section of the tape is so unhinged that I'm honest to god stumped on why it's even in here. But one thing is for sure, it definitely freaked me out the first time I saw it. Hell, it still freaks me out editing this. After zooming through a tunnel multiple times, we have completed the TF2 tape. And to end off this tape, we cut to police body cam footage of one of the officers that went to check on Charlotte. The tape ends with one of the most horrific pieces of imagery I have seen in any analog horror video. Warning, it's a little graphic. Well done on completing the TF2, waking your subconscious, video cassette. Please allow your brain to rest for at least 12 hours before continuing this video system. Once you have rested and you are ready, enter the cassette labeled TF3, The Shadow, Communion and Assimilation. This is the end of this tape. It would seem that somehow, Charlotte has merged with her dogs. As the officer does what we all would do in this situation and hightails it out of there, we cut to a message instructing us to begin our next tape, titled TF3, The Shadow, Communion, and Assimilation. And just like that, we have arrived at the end of our journey with Greylock. So I think you can understand why this video has taken so long to make. There is a lot to unpack here, and this is probably the most dense analog horror series I have ever seen. Trying to nail down every detail is simply impossible with the information that we have right now, but I nonetheless have tried to do my part in dissecting this amazing series. We are now at the part of the video where I have to try and make some kind of timeline for all of this, and I am hoping that my interpretation of this story can hold some of you over until we get answers. Let's move on to our timeline. When analyzing the story of Greylock, it is essential to keep concrete dates and events within our minds to properly determine what order they are taking place. Greylock has quite a few years that show up throughout its story, but I would argue that the beginning of the series dates back even before the earliest date that we are given. If you can recall, I have made it a point to state that space is if you can recall, I've made it a point to state that space, and the moon in particular, seem to have importance to the story that we are witnessing. And many of you will even recall that in tape 8, we got a brief glimpse of a broadcast that described how the moon was formed, when a large Mars-sized planet collided with the Earth, blowing it into countless little pieces. 
we are also told that the fragments of this Mars-sized planet are still stuck inside the Earth's crust to this day. I believe that this is the first event of this series, and I also believe that one of the fragments from this unknown planet is lodged inside Mount Greylock, and was later unearthed many years later. As for the moon itself, it is still hard to make out what its significance could actually be at this point in time. I'm still not sure what to make of it honestly. But moving forward, we come to many years later in ancient history, and Mount Greylock seems to be attracting people from all over the world. They come to make offerings and sacrifices to the mountain or whatever deity may live within it. At this time, I'm going to say that the deity these people were worshipping was the Tall Man, since it first appeared in Episode 6 when the mining operation started unearthing the tunnels within the mountain. Moving forward, we come to the foundation of Simeodyne. And it's not made explicit when the company was founded, but we do know that Percival C. Roswell, the president of Simeodyne in the 1960s, had a great-great-grandfather who founded the company, which would date their foundation somewhere in the 1800s, roughly. Throughout this time, Simeodyne would appear as a technology manufacturing company, slowly gaining powerful connections to the US government. However, I think it is clear that Simeodyne is much more than a technology manufacturer. This brings us to December 1963, the earliest year that the series has given us explicitly, and it is the start of the National Access Initiative, or the NAI program. In this tape, we learn that Simeodyne created this program to spy on the American people, and that they also orchestrated President Kennedy's assassination. We also get details like this red mask being overlaid with Percival C. Roswell's face and many other cloaked and masked figures in the woods. This points me in the direction to believe that Simeodyne is posing as a technology company but is actually some kind of secret cult that has great knowledge about Mount Greylock and what lies within it. I believe Simeodyne to be the descendants of those who have visited the mountain for thousands of years, and I believe their goal is to unearth the entity lying within the mountain. It does beg the question of why they are choosing to spy on the American people though. It has to be for some form of research, but what this research is, is something that can only be left up for interpretation at this time. We then hit 1965, where a six-year-old Tiffany Crisaldi is being interviewed by a mysterious doctor. What we learn from this is that Tiffany seems to have a strange ability that allows her to see things like the black door, which is referred to later on, and the tall man himself. I'm still not sure what this could mean, but it seems that Tiffany will become much more important in future Greylock tapes, as will her nameless doctor. We then make a pretty decent time jump to 1981, where Dr. Bernard Hayes is giving a speech about psychology and staring into the eyes of God as an equal. One thing that is interesting though is that Dr. Bernard Hayes seems to be discussing, and I'm totally going to say this wrong, Jungian psychology, which has some interesting elements that might ring a bell if I lay them out for you. In Jungian psychology, there are four major archetypes, the persona, the anima, or animus, the shadow, and the self. For the sake of simplification, let's focus on the self and the shadow. The self is what you show to everyone else around you. It is your personality and how others perceive you. The shadow, on the other hand, is what you don't show others, or rather the hidden and suppressed side of your persona. It is your animalistic side that you yourself don't actually acknowledge. This leads us to what is known as Jungian, <laughs> sorry, I can't say that right. This leads us to what is also known as Jungian analysis, an analytical approach to talk therapy that seeks to bring balance and union between the conscious and unconscious parts of the mind. This is eerily familiar to the latest tape that we have gotten in the series that we just covered. This would probably explain why the thought forms that are described to us in tape 3 are actually dangerous. We are told that creating a thought form requires a person to be in a heightened mental state that comes with effort and time. But when the thought form manifester is created and Unit 13 begins their research, these thought forms are created from the person's linking of their conscious and unconscious minds, or their self and their shadow. 
creating terrifying creatures straight from our nightmares. But moving back to our timeline, what comes next in the timeline of events is tape 6, seeing as it takes place in 1987, and everything that comes after can be traced back to the mining operation. It is around this time that Simeodyne gets in contact with Paul Morelli to begin a mining operation in Mount Greylock under the supervision of someone named Frank Porter. It seems that Simeodyne made contact with Dr. Bernard Hayes, and they decided to construct Unit 13 as a way to research thought forms even further. During this operation, the ancient tunnels where the sacrifices were made are unearthed, and the tall man is released. I believe that Simeodyne knew what they were doing when they let the mining crew clear the tunnels, and they knew that all of these men were probably going to die. They have knowledge that this operation is dangerous, and probably saw it as an opportunity to make new sacrifices to the tall man. Some strange details do arise from this tape though, like the fact that Paul has no idea who actually cleared the tunnels, or the fact that the crew continually begin to get sick and their food begins to rot as they all turn into monsters. What this illness actually is is still unknown to us, but if you remember in tape 12, we do get a small segment about parasites and how they are no match for man when he is well equipped, but it is obvious that Paul and his crew were not well equipped to deal with these parasites. This leads us to the infamous break-in incident. Now it is unclear to me what exactly happened in this tape, but I do have one theory that I do like. I think that rather than thought forms breaking into these people's homes, I believe that the people committing the break-ins are actually the mutated miners after they have been completely changed into these horrific monsters. The only thing keeping me from believing this, however, is that the mining incident took place in March, and the Max Headroom advertisement is dated in October. Not only would this be a full six month split in time where the miners are just hanging out, but Arnold the archaeologist mentions the break-ins in his logs from April 8th of the same year. This is the only detail convincing me that this theory is probably incorrect, but it seems like the most logical option that we have for now. If this is correct, however, it seems that many of the miners were detained by the police and were brought to a location known as Site B-651 for containment. The symptoms of the miners are archived between the 2nd and 3rd of April, the same month Arnold was killed. This theory seems solid, but we won't know for sure until we have more information. This brings us to the pregnancy event and Tiffany. We have a date for when Tiffany's baby disappeared, that being March 31st, which comes directly after the events of the mining incident. According to what we hear from Arnold in Tape 8, what happened to Tiffany was known as the pregnancy phenomena, meaning that she was not the only person who lost their child during this time. Sometime later, a GBS broadcast is made by Don Wright to assure the public that everything is returning back to normal, but the broadcast is hijacked. This third party who hijacked the broadcast is still unknown to us. The first thing that comes to mind is Simeodyne, but this doesn't make any sense since they were the ones who caused all of these events to happen, and they are probably trying to cover up their tracks. So there is another group at play in the series who is seemingly working against Simeodyne, labeling Don a liar before eventually killing him in his home, where he is found by a GBS producer. During this time, Arnold becomes paranoid and records his thoughts on a tape recorder after a day where he comes home and his house is unlocked. He states that he has gotten in contact with Jim Melgren, our private investigator working in the shadows, to try and solve what is happening and presumably expose Simeodyne. As Arnold is recording, he hears his basement door open and he is killed by the tall man, and it is here that we learn that it has the power to mimic people's voices. Then on May 18th, we begin tape 10, with Alexander calling Tiffany, and we find out that she has passed and is taken to a medical office for an autopsy conducted by Dr. Heinrich Albert, who finds a symbol carved into her body. We still do not know who carved this symbol, but it seems to be the same people who left the message inside the rat for Jim. This could mean that this is also the group who performed the ritual to revive Tiffany at the end of the tape, but we still cannot be sure of this. One of the biggest enigmas of the series happens to be Tiffany herself, or how or why she was resurrected in the first place. 
The same goes for things like Jim finding a dead rat and deciding to cut it open to find a tape inside. We just don't have clear answers at this time. The next event of the series comes in the form of some brief camera footage seen in Tape 9, with someone finding out the NAI program is actually a scam and that they are being spied on. It seems that this person is silenced though, because Simeodyne is still up and running by the year of 1993, which brings us to Tape 3 and Tape 12. Both of these tapes display the TF orientation tapes for Unit 13. Tape 3 is addressed to Alexander Marsh, and Tape 12 is addressed to Jim's daughter, Charlotte Melgren. Let's start off with Alexander. I think he joined Unit 13's program to try and get Tiffany back, as we are told in this tape that if a person has enough willpower, they can bring back a deceased loved one in the form of a thought form. Tape 12 shows us the second stage of the Unit 13 orientation protocols, but one thing that is still confusing to me in this episode is that the TF system tape addressing Charlotte wasn't manufactured until 1993. But when we transfer over to the security footage that was recorded on the night of her death, it is dated to be in 1992, a whole year before this tape was manufactured. So why the hell would Simeodyne and Unit 13 create a tape addressing a person who has been dead for a year? Well, I don't think they did, actually. Let me explain. Later in Tape 12, we see a message that the tape has had unauthorized alterations made to it, and we are warned not to continue. I believe that this is an altered version of the TF orientation tape that was sent to Jim Melgren. And I believe that this third party faction who is represented by this strange symbol are the ones who sent it. In episode 10, the audio tape found in the rat states that they are going to tell Jim a story that he has wanted to hear for a long time. I think that this story is the story of how his daughter died by morphing with the dogs. Oh yeah, and if you're asking why she died by morphing with the dogs, I have no clue, man. I also don't have a good answer for what the actual entity was that killed her. It looks to be the same thought form from Tape 9, but I'm just not convinced about that yet. Although it would make sense, since this is around the same time Simeodyne is creating artificial thought forms, and we see this same skeleton figure kill the little girl in 1994 that seemed to follow her home from a Unit 13 facility. Now this brings us to the first two tapes, which are the most confusing to place in this timeline. Let's start with Tape 2. We don't know when it's taking place in our timeline, but I have a pretty good idea of what happens in it. Someone appears to be investigating the site where two men found a mangled body while hiking in Mount Greylock. They seem to encounter something lodged inside of this tree, and after this we cut back to the car, and like I mentioned before, it seems that something is off about the driver. I believe the thing the person saw on the tree was a thought form that ended up stealing this individual's vehicle, and the pounding that we hear on the window is actually the original driver trying to get back into their car. And then the thought form drives off to do god only knows what. And finally, we have arrived at the first tape of the series. I think it's safe to say that this is probably the farthest point in the series, and the person extracting the files is in fact Jim Melgren. After learning about the death of his daughter from this third party, he became invested in taking down Simeodyne along with whatever evil they are working with. He seems to be getting files to develop a case against Simeodyne and expose them. However, I think that there could be a different reason he is doing this entirely. Remember how in the first tape there was a glitch when the camera attempted to switch to the morgue of the facility? I've even highlighted it as a strange detail that this Simeodyne facility has a morgue. But what if it's not a Simeodyne facility? We know that the medical office in tape 10 had a morgue, and that Tiffany was resurrected inside the morgue as well. Maybe after she was brought back to life, she destroyed the camera and escaped. And I think that Jim Melgren knows that Tiffany is special, and I believe that he is looking for her due to her connection to the tall man. How he knows this information is still a mystery, but I feel pretty confident in this theory. 
but unfortunately, the series has a long way to go before answering our questions and is still very much a huge mystery. And who knows what is waiting for us in the next tape. Hello everybody. Since this video is already super long, I won't take up too much more of your time, but I just want to first and foremost apologize for how long this video took to make. It's been in the works for months now, and juggling the making of this video with the other elements of my life has seriously been a huge undertaking for myself. It really was a challenge at some points, so I do hope that you enjoy. I also want to thank you if you've made it to this point in the video. I mean, seriously, you're an absolute trooper for sticking through the entire thing, and it shows that I'm not the only one who's passionate enough to talk about this series. If you all have any theories of your own, please put them in the comments below. I would love to encourage discussion around this incredible series that I'm now very passionate about. I'm honestly super excited, and I can't wait to see where it goes. But when all is said and done, I am very glad that this video is over with, and I will definitely be covering Greylock in the future. I also have some more video ideas uh, cooking up in my brain, but I wouldn't expect them anytime soon. Unfortunately, school is about to start back up, and it's looking like it's going to be one of the busiest quarters I've ever had in college, so that's just the way it's going to have to be. I apologize for all the waiting for all this longer content that I'm wanting to put out, but that's just how it's going to have to be for a minute. Once again, if you've made it to this point in the video, thank you so much. You're a trooper, and yeah, just stay cool, stay safe out there, watch Greylock, and uh, yeah, thank you so much. Seriously. Alright, until the next one, bye bye guys.